With the best of intentions, and sometimes the worst of intentions, politicians throughout our history have used the criminal law to address social harms, often only making matters worse. While we've now recognized the criminal law's failings in our approach to assisted dying and cannabis, we've yet to come to that same recognition when it comes to the human rights of sex workers and people who use drugs. Seven years ago in Bedford, the Supreme Court told us that the laws then on the books unconstitutionally prevented sex workers from taking measures that would increase their safety and possibly save their lives. Our current laws enforced since that decision? Well, they don't fare much better. Now, in another area of consensual crime, the Association of Chiefs of Police has joined public health experts across our country and called for the decriminalization of the possession of all drugs for personal use. The status quo, in their words, has proven to be ineffective. Welcome to Uncommons. I'm Nate Erskine-Smith, And on this episode, we talk sex, drugs, and evidence-based policy, and I'm joined by Richard Elliott, the Executive Director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. Richard, thanks for joining me. My pleasure to be here, Nate. The Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network was started in 1992. Can you speak a little bit about the beginnings of the organization and the kind of work that you're undertaking today, both here in Canada and, and around the world? As an organization that's devoted to protecting and promoting human rights in the HIV response, we have from the very beginning obviously been concerned about a whole range of communities and populations that are affected by HIV. Certainly, we've seen uh, historically that the HIV pandemic led to a whole raft of human rights violations against various communities that were tainted by the stigma surrounding HIV and all of the assumptions and stigma around sex and drugs and so on. Obviously, that includes the LGBT community, but from the get-go, we've been advocating not only for the rights of the LGBT community, but also for sex workers and people who use drugs, people in prison, migrants, uh, various populations who, in one way or another, are at risk of not only HIV, but of their human rights being violated. And those two things are really fundamentally connected. The more we don't respect and protect people's human rights in so many ways, the more we actually make people and communities more vulnerable to HIV in the first place and make the consequences of being HIV positive that much worse. So unless we actually defend and protect human rights, we're always going to have a real limitation in our ability to effectively respond to HIV. This is a common refrain now in the public health world that we need to address human rights in order to be effective in responding to public health challenges. Very simply, if we further marginalize people and we have a raft of evidence to know this now, that their health outcomes will always be worse. Absolutely. And we see the connection between health and other human rights, keeping in mind that health itself is a human right. We see those connections in so many ways. If you don't have safe working conditions, we're seeing what's happening with COVID, for example. If you don't have adequate sick days, we see what's happening with COVID. If you infringe people's freedom of expression, for example, and censor safer sex education material or harm reduction material, then we put people at greater risk of acquiring HIV or hepatitis C or of overdose. If you deny prisoners access to the same health services that exist outside of prisons, you make their health outcomes worse. You criminalize people, you drive them away from services. The way we structure our societies and respect or violate human rights really is a huge driver of better or worse health outcomes for people. And in some cases, it also limits government's ability to respond in the course of the pandemic. And so we've seen recently $350 million delivered by Minister Hussein's office to support community organizations in responding to the COVID crisis. And we see the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to support individuals affected. I was on a call recently with a representative from a sex workers organization here in Canada, and she very clearly said we don't get support in a clear way from the the $350 million fund, and certainly not in a way that we can then support sex workers directly. And we don't see sex workers able to access the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And so if we have frameworks that push people further to the margins of our society, we not only make their health outcomes worse, but our government policies can't get to them in the end either. 
Absolutely. And there is an outstanding proposal in front of the minister responsible for women and gender equality to actually ensure that the response to COVID is flexible enough to actually address the practical needs of sex workers whose livelihoods obviously are seriously affected. And that hasn't yet been something that's come to fruition, but we have certainly been very supportive of sex workers' requests that the minister deal with those issues, and I I hope that will happen soon. And here we see not only policies that might ignore certain vulnerable populations, but we see government policies that actually make the situation worse for them through the criminal law. And so we previously saw laws on the books that criminalized sex workers directly. And while the prostitution reference in the early 90s wasn't the time to strike those laws down in the Supreme Court's view, we see through Bedford an approach that recognized that the law was putting sex workers' lives at risk by pushing the whole industry underground. The Harper government responds with focus on exploitation and to say we are going to now criminalize the people who purchase sex work and not the sex workers themselves, which still, though, pushes the industry underground in its own way. And I wonder, we've seen at the most recent policy convention in Halifax from the Liberal Party, a call to decriminalize the situation further. Is that the answer here? Removing the criminal law in a whole bunch of domains, including when it comes to sex work, but including when it comes to drugs, is essential. But let's not leave anyone thinking that it's a panacea. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. As long as you continue to criminalize people you have exactly the kind of impact that you've just described. You drive people to the margins of society, you put them at greater risk, you make it harder for them to get connected to the services and supports that actually uh, let people live healthy, safe, dignified lives. Or seek out protection from the law uh, in the case of sex workers, where it's absolutely necessary for them to seek out protection. And people use drugs. Um, exactly. And, you know, this is not this is not so much the case any longer in Canada, fortunately, thanks to legal struggles that have been achieved. But that certainly remains the case for LGBT communities in many countries around the world. Time and time again, what you see is when the state and its agents stigmatize, hunt, prosecute, uh, assault, detain, torture, imprison. It's no surprise that your effort to deal with the health challenges that those communities face is actually hampered. And so we've seen that with the fight over harm reduction services, including supervised consumption sites that also had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada to challenge the overly broad use of the criminal law there. And the courts there recognized that criminalizing people to the point that they are at risk of prosecution when they go to a particular health service could not stand as a matter of basic human rights. And so they said, no, you have to carve out some limits on criminalizing people when it comes in a conflict with access to health service. Similar sort of reasoning at play in the Bedford case about sex work. You know, the court found, based on all the evidence, criminalizing sex workers and their clients and the workplaces that they work in, formal and informal, actually creates harm. It exacerbates risk of harm. It doesn't actually protect. And yet now we have reintroduced legislation on sex work that pretty much replicates the same harms as the legislation that the court already said was unconstitutional. It's kind of, uh, you know, old wine and new bottles. They've slapped different words on the legislation, but it's the same in substance. We've still got the laws that criminalize possession of drugs. So that creates a barrier to people getting access to services. So we need to get rid of these, these things that really have no basis in either principle or in evidence. In fact, we have a lot of evidence to show that they're really harmful. And what do you say to someone who looks at the previous laws and says, okay, I agree they should have been struck down because I don't want to criminalize the sex workers, predominantly women, not only women, but the sex workers who are themselves being exploited. But now that I see the law and its penalties directed at the people purchasing sex, the exploiters, as it were, why is that a problem? Is that not directing the, the, the consequences of the law in the right place? Uh, No, it's not. And for two reasons, primarily. One, it's a fallacy to equate any purchase of a sexual service with exploitation. It's a fallacy to treat all sex work as inherently exploitative, as akin to trafficking and so on. It's just not factually correct. And there's ample evidence to that effect, including from sex workers themselves who dispute the notion that the work that they do is somehow inherently exploitative, which is not to deny, of course, that like in all cases of work, there are workplaces and work situations in which there is exploitation and abuse. 
Um, but it's not something unique to sex work. The exchange of sexual services for money is just the exchange of sexual services for money. There's nothing inherent in it that means it's exploitation that must be targeted through the criminal law. The second reason that it's problematic, of course, is that to target the clients of sex workers actually produces many of the same harms as targeting sex workers for criminal prosecution themselves. If you think about it, if the two parties to the transaction uh, or potential transaction are criminalized, uh, as we've seen with the prohibitions on communicating for the purposes of the prostitution in the past, for example, then what you're doing is actually creating an environment in which it's harder for uh, that negotiation to be done properly. It's rushed. Uh, sex workers are looking over their shoulders, concerned about police arriving on the scene and, and arresting them. Okay, so we've changed the equation slightly, and it's now only one party to the transaction that is directly criminalized. It's still the same dynamic. And sex workers have said over and over again, and the emerging evidence is showing that this produces the same kinds of problematic risks to sex workers. If their clients are criminalized, their work is still effectively criminalized. If the workplaces in which they work are criminalized, as the new, not so new, <laughs> legislation continues to do, they are still put in marginal situations at greater risk of harm, less able to access the protection that is supposedly there under the law, but isn't in fact. So the notion that we need sex work specific criminal laws has really been rejected time and time again, and for good reason. And one thing, just as a final point, that sex workers and their allies, including our organization, will point out regularly is that if you're concerned about violence, abuse, exploitation, and so on, the law already has tools to deal with that. Let's target that conduct. Let's target the human traffickers. Let's target the people who are not only on in the sex trade side, obviously there's a, a human trafficking component to labor as well, but let's target the wrongs that we are very specific about rather than having a catch-all broad-based prohibition that is harming people. Yes, being careful not to fall in to the easy but facile assumption that is so often present in these discussions about sex work that any third party, for example, that is involved in the work surrounding what a sex worker is doing is somehow a trafficker or right. an exploiter, because that's just not true. From a policy perspective, I, I remember looking at the prostitution reference and looking at the insight case and thinking, well, this insight case is going to change the law in a number of different respects, where we are looking at the harmful consequences of the law, and we see the protection of security of the person to such a, a stringent degree, I think, through Section 7 in, in a good way, I thought, okay, we're not going to see the prostitution laws exist in the way that they are if the Supreme Court gets a hold of this again. At the same time, I think it's easy for a number of Canadians to simply think, why in the world would someone want to sell their body? And then there's that quick assumption to say, there must be exploitation here, because who would want to do this? There continues to be a significant stigma there that has to be addressed. Absolutely. And there are any number of other kinds of jobs where someone might say, I would not want to do that job. That doesn't mean that therefore it should be criminal to do that job or to employ someone to do that job, particularly if the people who are doing that job are saying, you know what, this is an option that works for me for a whole bunch of reasons. How is it helpful to anybody in that circumstance to throw the prospect of criminalization into the mix? It actually, and, and the evidence has borne this out time and time again, that it really just does a lot of harm and doesn't do any particular good. If you're concerned about people feeling like they have few options for their work that they choose, which by the way, doesn't just relate to sex work, then let's actually invest in the things that make sure that people have better levels of income, greater security of housing, more access to education, skills development, et cetera, so that people feel they have a broader range of choices. If we care about human rights, we have to respect autonomy and individual choice without that level of judgment that then is reflected in criminal punishment completely at odds with that basic respect for for choice and, and for and really for dignity, the, this idea that people can make these choices for themselves. It, it is at odds with that. It presumes a problem when there isn't one and then comes up with a problematic solution to that supposed problem. If someone is being criminally assaulted, et cetera, or confined or coerced or extorted or whatever, then that's a problem, obviously, from a human rights perspective. But let's actually use the tools that are there to deal with that. And it's not something specific about sex work that, that is going right. to lead us to use the criminal law. And let's be specific about the real harms that we're targeting and have policies that address those specific harms. The stated objective of these laws, right, is end demand. Sex work's been around for millennia. A few years, yeah. <laughs> Notwithstanding various legal regimes, many of which have tried to stamp it out 
let's just accept that maybe that's not going to happen and that we should respect people's autonomy and assist them to protect their health and safety when they do various kinds of work, including sex work. So many of these same arguments apply to the criminalization of drugs as well. There's this false assumption that drug use in in every case is so very harmful it ought to be punished in some fashion or or stamped out, which is also we've seen throughout history an, an impossibility. And we also see the same unjustifiable but also inexplicable way that the criminal law targets and punishes the very people that the policy objectives seek to help. I've pushed for decriminalization. I've introduced a bill in this parliament, just as in the last parliament, to push further towards decriminalization and treating drug use as a, as a health issue. What do you see as the ideal policy moving forward to reform our drug laws? Again, if we start from the premise, as you already quite rightly have, that drug use is something that is part of the human condition and has been and will continue to be, notwithstanding what the law says, then we start to think about whether criminally prosecuting people is going to do anything useful or whether it's only going to do harm. And frankly, I think the evidence is overwhelming at this point that using the criminal law in the domain of drugs, and I'm speaking here specifically about the personal possession and use of drugs, is nothing but harmful. You're absolutely right that When we stigmatize people, we're not going to actually help them deal with what is a health issue. For example, if we recognize that not all sex work is inherently exploitative, we also have to recognize, as the evidence shows us, that drug use per se is not necessarily a bad thing and it's not necessarily harmful. In fact, all of us use, or almost all of us, use various substances all the time in our lives. Some of them happen to be illegal. Some of them happen to be legal. Some of them happen to even be legally regulated for sale. Their legal status doesn't necessarily bear any logical evidence-based correlation with the harm or potential for harm that those particular substances carry. If that were the case, then alcohol and tobacco, for example, would not be legally available for sale, while a number of other drugs that people use are criminally prohibited, but they are much less harmful in many instances. And we know from the evidence that the vast majority of use of drugs that are still currently criminally prohibited is actually not something that is problematic for the people who use them or for uh, them in their lives or their work and so on. There's plenty of drug use that happens that is technically a crime, but it's not harmful. It's only a small proportion of the use of drugs that are currently criminally prohibited that actually poses some problem for, say, the user or people around them in their context. And that, of course, is a legitimate concern. Other than that, it's not really the business of the state, I would suggest, to tell people you're a criminal for using substance X when it's a victimless crime. So we need to start from that premise and then think about, okay, well, in those circumstances where there is some harm associated with the use of that drug or potential for some harm, what is the proper response? Because that's a legitimate concern. Well, that is a health concern. So why would we then automatically turn to the criminal law to deal with what is a health concern? This is part of the thinking that underlies harm reduction policies and programs, which are an essential part of our response, and yet still remain such an underfunded small proportion of our response compared to all the money and time and effort put into actually continuing to criminalize and stigmatize people for their use of drugs. You you mentioned alcohol and tobacco, and it's always struck me as we criminalize people disproportionately and negatively affect Black and Indigenous populations in doing so, as we undermine health efforts that we say we care about. You know, we have a public health campaign that is federally funded to address the stigma associated with seeking treatment. And the number one stigma is our own law. It's very frustrating. And then when we see the way that governments have in recent years addressed tobacco use, we've moved 50 years ago, 50% of Canadians use tobacco. Now that number is under 15%. And we didn't throw a person in jail to address the problem. We addressed it through public health measures to restrict public use and and access. And we also education predominantly to change people's views of the substance and and to address what we know about it and and how the, the real potential harms. It's frustrating to see what has been successful in another area disregarded largely with respect to other substances. And instead, we use the blunt instrument of the criminal law that that undermines, as I say, our, our health efforts. In looking at this issue for a number of years, I've always thought of it as a, let's change the criminal law with respect to the criminalization of simple possession. And then let's make sure that there is a an uncontaminated supply 
because we know that the vast majority of deaths in this opioid crisis, which is only getting worse in mm -hmm. the course of this pandemic, is because of a contaminated drug supply. On the decriminalization side, it's a, it's a simple matter of deleting the penalty for simple possession. That piece is then done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it should be as simple as that. And, uh, you know, the bill that you've introduced that would do that, I think, is long overdue. So, yes, we should we should see that bill go forward and we should just remove the criminal prohibition on possession for personal use. Full stop. I initially framed a caucus policy resolution as we should treat drug use as a health issue. We should expand harm reduction and treatment options and we should reclassify drug possession as an administrative violation. And the reason I framed it that way is because of Portugal and we yeah. see Portugal instead of addressing it through the criminal law, an individual has to go before a dissuasion panel made up of a medical professional, a legal professional, and a social worker, and they take a public health focus approach, which is good, but it can be quite coercive at the same time, and there are still potential fines and potential serious penalties. They have solid success on the numbers of the increased numbers of people seeking treatment, reductions in overdose deaths, but when I met with you and Sandra, I suggested putting this on the table and you said, well, why do you need that level of coercion? Walk me through your <laughs> objections to the, to the Portugal model and why it's a positive step forward, but not as far as you think it ought to go. Portugal is definitely a positive step forward for, and you know, the numbers bear it out for 20 years now. Uh, you know, they've seen the positive health and social outcomes of removing criminal penalties for possession and instead putting resources into health and other social services. Although it's an improvement, and we've had the, you know, the Portuguese drugs are actually at a conference here not too long ago in Toronto, a couple of years ago, speaking about this issue. There are reasons why it's not, it doesn't go far enough. I think on the most fundamental level, it's a question of principle. Why is it that the state has any business telling people what substances that they can put in their body? They think the only potential justification for the state, you know, stepping in and wagging its finger or worse with coercive measures might be because of a concern about public health or public safety. Those are the two legitimate concerns here. Well, given that the vast majority of drug use is not, in fact, something that poses a problem to health or safety, in most cases, there's simply no role for the state period. So why would it be that even if you're no longer a criminal per se, but you're found in possession of X substance, you still need to go before some sort of panel that is going to wag its finger at you and say, you know, this is really not something you should be doing. And why don't you go talk to a counselor and so on? Why do I need to go talk to a counselor because I want to smoke up a joint on the weekend any more than I need to go and see a counselor because I want to have a glass of wine on the weekend? There's, there's no real good reason for the state to be that sort of patronizing and controlling of people's private personal behavior. And where there is a concern about public safety, well, again, we already have tools in the law to deal with public safety, uh, whether someone is using drugs or not, if they're posing a risk to public safety, you know, we have ways to intervene. We don't need to criminalize drugs for that. And if the concern is health in that small number of cases where someone is actually using drugs in ways that are potentially problematic for their own health, well, how is it that criminalizing that person is going to help deal with that health problem? What's going to help with that is actually getting that person connected to services that are accessible to them and that are evidence-based and so on. So it's really hard to see what the criminal law can ever bring that's going to be helpful to the scenario in any circumstance. And I will say, <laughs> I first thought that the benefit was simply an intervention to ensure that someone who has problematic substance use is helped into treatment and maybe even required to seek treatment, that that could be a helpful intervention. But then on the evidence, from what I have seen at least, mandatory treatment is not effective. And that really changed my mind because in a universe where mandatory treatment could be effective, we could see, you mentioned a glass of wine and the joint comparison, but we can also talk about more harmful substances or more destructive behavior, harmful to their own self-interest. And if there were a perfect way to say, we're going to intervene and ensure that you are getting the help that you need, and we're going to force you to get the help that you need, if that were effective, I could imagine some instances where that might well work, but on the evidence, it doesn't seem like it's effective. The evidence is, I think, doesn't support that kind of coercive use of, of state power. And I think while those are absolutely scenarios that, of course, we should be concerned about because we have compassion for people and we want people not to be hurting themselves, the bar should be pretty high 
for the state stepping in and saying, you lack the capacity to make a decision about what's best for you. And therefore, we're going to force you to submit to some kind of medical or quasi-medical intervention. That's a pretty high bar to clear, or at least it ought to be. And unless someone is having a psychotic break, for example, which people can have whether or not they're using substances, it's hard to see how coercing someone into treatment that they're not prepared to be in is likely going to stick or have any real benefit. To focus only on drugs is clearly reflective of the stigma and fear that people have in relation to drug use. And I think that's a really good point. <laughs> is born out of also, when you look at the history, born in, in many ways out of previous prejudices that people yeah, have had against in... uh, people of color. Exactly right. There's something a bit odd about Canada, to its credit, going to the UN at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, as it did a couple of years ago and spearheading a really important initiative to challenge the stigma surrounding drugs and the stigmatization of people who use them, while at the same time maintaining the most overt form of the state itself stigmatizing people, which is to criminalize them for behavior that in almost all cases is really about their own personal autonomy and isn't actually problematic in any particular way that would warrant the scrutiny of the state. You know, Canada is is preaching one thing at the UN, and it's good that it's doing so, but we kind of need to apply that lesson here at home as well. If we really don't want to stigmatize people, then how about we stop criminalizing them? It's not just Canada either. From no, the documents that I've read, <laughs> there is a growing divide, and maybe it used to be the other way around, that domestic policies weren't as harsh as some of the international policies that had been really driven by the United States. But the international conversations that different countries at the UN are having about drug use and ways to address drug use are much more sensible today in many respects. They focus on decriminalization options. The UNAIDS has a document signed on by other UN organizations that really sets out a clear path to decriminalization among other initiatives to take a human rights centered approach. And it seems like our domestic policies now can't catch up or haven't yet caught up to where the international consensus is. It might be overstating it a bit to say that it's an international consensus. Uh, would, fair. Would well, Bangladesh <laughs> still wants to kill people for using drugs, so fair. And, and, and Russia and the Philippines. And, you know, unfortunately, the war on drugs is alive and well in much of the world. There is certainly a growing number of states in international fora who are calling for a rethink of the approach, including the criminalization of simple possession. And that's great. And certainly there's been progress on that front over the last 10 years. It's it's noticeable. Certainly there is now a consensus among the agencies of the UN system who now have a common position across all the agencies that decriminalizing simple possession is a necessary part of the response. That's what uh, I had so in that, terms of international consensus. You know, yeah, so that's pretty good. <laughs> you, know, you no longer have the UN drug body that is really pushing for harsh criminalization Yes, and that has been a a real shift. The the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is part of that UN agency consensus now that we need to shift away from that. Um, There is not that consensus among member states at the UN. not yet. yet. Not yet. (laughs) It's very divisive. It's a subject that is increasingly discussed, I would say, as a legitimate policy option that a growing number of states want to pursue or already have in place. And you know what? The sky hasn't fallen. (laughs) And in fact, the drug control conventions that Canada and virtually all other member states of the UN have signed on to from decades past don't actually require that the possession of drugs for personal use be made a criminal offense. So we have the wiggle room within international law. We would not be offside to decriminalize simple possession. There's no barrier there. In fact, Canada has done something already to its credit that is in fact offside with some other obligations under the Drug Control Convention, and that's legalize and regulate the sale of cannabis. That is actually a violation of the international conventions. Canada should be commended for taking that step because it's done it for good reasons, but it's actually legally a little more dodgy than just decriminalizing simple possession. So if we can do that, then surely joining you know many, many other countries in decriminalizing simple possession of drugs shouldn't be really that hard to do, given all the evidence we have, given all the support from so many quarters, not just international, but domestic, for decriminalizing simple possession, you know, including you know members of your own caucus <laughs> who have expressed their support for this, including through the policy resolution that was brought forward at the last convention. There's at least one other opposition party that has a resolution stating as a party policy that they support decriminalization. So this is not a, you know, not a fringe position. It's actually really well evidence-based and based on human rights considerations, and it's totally legally feasible. 
if we listen to public health experts in the course of the COVID crisis, surely we should listen to public health experts when it comes to the opioid crisis. And unanimously, pretty near, they have called for decriminalization of simple possession so that we can treat drug use as a health issue that it is. I wonder, (coughs) though, if we ought not to go further. And there was a mother who had lost a child to the opioid crisis messaging me on Twitter to say decriminalization isn't enough. Agreed. It's because it doesn't get at the contaminated drug supply. Completely agree. So when we look to what might be offside those conventions, but still probably the right thing to do and consistent with the evidence, which is focusing on a safer supply and focusing on an uncontaminated drug supply, we are then entering into the world of legalization and regulation and not decriminalization. And do you think that ought to be the focus of our efforts as much as anything else? Yes. And it's not it's not either or. So we've been talking about decriminalizing possession for your personal use. So that's on the demand side. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't also be doing things on the supply side. And the mother that you're referring to is absolutely right. I actually think of there's probably three prongs to our approach to drug policy that we need. One of them is the decriminalization of the possession. Another is scaling up harm reduction services that we know are evidence-based and are needed uh, that we haven't taken to scale anywhere yet in Canada. Uh, you know, needle storage program, supervised consumption sites, naloxone take-home programs, and so on. And then actually a kind of harm reduction, which is to address things upstream on the supply side and make sure that people are not getting substances that are going to poison them and kill them, which is unfortunately happening far too frequently. Those are three parts of our response. And I think they all we need movement on all of them. We're further along the track on some than others, but we absolutely need to address things on the supply side. And if we could get out of the mindset of thinking, of drugs are bad and people who use drugs are bad, then we could actually start thinking about drugs in some respects like other consumer products. And instead of thinking that a criminal law framework is the way to go here, let's actually think about a consumer protection framework. We we legalize and regulate the supply of other substances and other consumer products, whether it's cars, baby toys, you know, what have you, because we want to minimize the risk of harm because those are products that people will consume or use. So let's actually make sure that the likelihood of them suffering some injury when they do so is reduced as much as possible. Why would that not be the case with drugs? We already do it with alcohol, you know, which one can consume safely to some degree, but we also rely upon controls about percentage of alcohol, good manufacturing practices, so that things aren't contaminated, et cetera. You know, server awareness programs so that you're not giving people too much and then they are at risk of harm to themselves. These are policy options, regulatory options that open up if you actually get the criminal law out of the way. And you can use a more fine-tuned approach than the very blunt approach of the criminal law. Yeah, I've always thought we should regulate drugs according to their respective harms. We already do with respect to some drugs. So morphine is a legal drug. It's just heavily regulated and heavily restricted given its potential for harm. But when you look at a recent tragic death and and we see a, a young individual use shrooms and have a psychotic episode, murder a loved one, and the court deems it automatism. But there's an instance where if we had a regulated supply, that probably doesn't happen. That harm could have been prevented, most likely. Exactly right. And so we've come a long way expanding some harm reduction options, expanding safe consumption sites across the country and providing some serious dollars behind expanding treatment options as well, but not enough. And then we haven't really made a dent in any way whatsoever on addressing the criminal justice reform except for cannabis. And we then, interestingly, have made more progress on ensuring an uncontaminated drug supply by way of pilot projects. Which have been important. Which are important, but but then need to be scaled up in a more serious way to ensure that they are then addressing the scale of the harm. And, And not to say that the regulatory framework that has been put in place for cannabis is necessarily perfect because it's not by any means. There's definitely room for improvement on a bunch of fronts there. But it is uh, an illustration of the fact that once you say, okay, we're going to take, at least in theory, a blanket criminal prohibition out of the picture here, then there are a bunch of different things that come into play about regulating potency, what can be sold, how it can be packaged, where and when and what hours and so on. Good manufacturing practices for the manufacturers of products so that you don't get contaminated product uh, that causes harm to people. Those are things that then come into play as tools that you can use. So that's the key point, I think, to take from the cannabis experience is that there's no obvious reason why you can't do that with other substances as well. We've done it now with alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, prescription medications. You know, these are all substances that people ingest 
sometimes they cause harm or have the potential to cause harm. And because of that, we want to regulate them with a view to minimizing the harm. And the conversations we've had are, are shared in many respects in terms of the policy response and addressing the potential harms, where when you look at the protection of sex workers and the transaction and sale of sex, if you criminalize either party and you push it underground, the transaction becomes significantly less safe in many respects for the sex worker. They don't have the ability to turn to the law for protection, and the law itself jeopardizes the people we would otherwise want to protect. Similarly, with respect to drugs. I mean, decriminalization of simple possession really only tackles part of the picture because unless you provide a legal framework for the the seller as well as the purchaser, you are going to continue to see an unsafe supply. And it requires really stringent and, and thoughtful regulations to both problems to say, we're going to allow this consensual activity in both cases to occur, and we're going to focus on the actual harms, not the perceived harms, but the actual harms that are potential in the course of the activity. So I, I totally agree with that. I would just add the point that while we need to act on both the decriminalizing of personal possession and decriminalizing and, and legally regulating on the supply side, it would be a mistake to think that we have to have the perfect solution on both fronts before we can move forward with any part of it. For sure. Even even if we didn't address, you know, the issue of legalizing and, and regulating a safe supply of currently criminalized substances, which we should, there would still be enormous value to decriminalizing the possession of them. We would be way ahead if we did that. You know, over the last five years for which we have data, and this is police reported data, there have been over 470,000 drug arrests in Canada. And more than 70% of those have been for simple possession. Holy shit. Think of the resources that that represents that we could be using in a different way. So just the harm itself of being criminalized, charged with a crime, you know, going through the court process, if it proceeds that far, potentially getting a criminal record and all of the sort of downstream consequences of that. Even if we just stopped doing that and did nothing else, <laughs> we would be ahead. Now, of course, we should do more, including on the supply side. But this ought to be a fairly simple no-brainer. It's been called for for years that we just stop criminalizing people for using substances. Full stop. It just should not be a crime. <laughs> well, it's a useful place to close because I, I hope that the push on the opioid crisis and that that continues to change people's minds. But I also hope that the conversation, the national conversation we're currently having about policing and racism. When we look at the enforcement of the drug laws, and those are staggering numbers in terms of police resources being invested to really harm people's lives rather than help people's lives, and no doubt disproportionately impacting in a negative way Black and Indigenous people here in Canada. I can't help but think that the movement for police reform is also a, a moment in time to, to take a serious look at our drug laws and change them for the better. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a point that we made to the Toronto Board of Health just recently when they were considering the proposal about decriminalizing simple possession. We pointed out this particular dimension of the problem as well. The war on drugs has been racist from the beginning. It remains racist to this day. We have ample evidence from some jurisdictions in the U.S. about the racist enforcement of our drug laws. We have less of that data in Canada, in part because it's not being collected. And that's actually a really important point. Unless we can gather that data disaggregated on a bunch of fronts, including race, then it's hard to get the full picture. But we do have some data from some smaller scale studies, at least with respect to, say, enforcement of cannabis possession that there has been disproportionate targeting of Black people, including here in Toronto, for example. And to the extent that people who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum are also disproportionately uh, racialized people, well, those people who are then targeted in the war on drugs, there's going to be a racist uh, dimension to that. And if you look at the incarceration rates, we know, and this is not necessarily specific to drug offenses because we don't have that data, we know that Black people and Indigenous people are disproportionately represented in prison populations. So there's enough there to say, hey, there's a problem and that our drug laws are at least contributing to that problem and therefore they warrant a good look on that score as well. Well, Toronto debates reducing police budgets by 10%. If we reformed and overhauled our drug laws consistent with the evidence, we might well find that 10%. We might indeed. It would be a really good place to start. Not the end of the inquiry, but definitely a good part of it. Exactly. Well, Richard, I, I honestly, I lean on in the course of this job, lots of people who are far smarter and more articulate than I am. So I consider you, you one of those people and I really, and, okay. and Sandra as well. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time and, and advocacy and, and I'll definitely be in touch.
Well, thank you, Nate, and uh, good luck with the bills on decriminalization. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Uncommons. Remember to subscribe at uncommons.ca for future episodes and recommend future guests and topics on social media at BY Nate. Media at BY Nate. Media at BY Nate. Media at BY Nate. Media at